I think it's important that we have on film Virginia saying that the cat is lovely. lovely. I think that that's, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that's an important thing. That that they uh, take out of all this is that the cat is lovely. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to-be-read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Corrine from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Port Moody Public Library book chats. I think one thing that we can all agree on Not many things like that, but there's one thing we can all agree on is that we're pretty excited about this next category um, because I think it's really important to all of us that we have a good diverse collection for everybody. Um, So our category today is a book by an LGBTQ plus author. So I can't wait to hear what everybody has. So we are going to go to Sadie, who's going to kick us off with her book. All right, so the book that I am going to talk about is called Dark and Deepest Red, and it is by Anna Marie McLemore. And this book tells two kind of intertwining stories. Um, Much of the books that I really enjoy will kind of have the same kind of format to them, where one story is told in the past and one story is told in the present day. And so this one is the same. One story is set in Strasbourg in 1518, and one is set in the small town of Briar Meadows in the present day. So in 1518, the story revolves around Lavinia, or Lala, and her aunt. Um, Lala and her aunt were forced to leave their home many, many years ago to escape persecution for their Romani heritage. So they have settled in Strasbourg, and for the most part, they have been able to to build a life for themselves there. Um, This does, however, mean that they are having to hide away their heritage and hide away their culture in order to save their lives. They explain away their darker skin by claiming a connection to Italian nobility. Um, Lala keeps very close to a group of young white women who are envied in the town. And both Lala and her aunt keep the secret of the transgender boy, Alifair, who they take in as a child who comes to live with them. So they have all sort of managed to stay under the radar until the summer of 1518. So in this summer, a very strange fever sweeps into Strasbourg. The sickness causes residents of the town, mainly women, to dance. They dance and they dance and they dance and they dance and they dance. And no matter what their families do or the town officials do or the church does, these women will not stop dancing. It's like they have no control over their bodies. Some of them dance so much that they actually dance themselves to death. Now, with no other explanation, rumors of witchcraft start to be heard And Lala, her aunt, and Alifair's differences start to be noticed more and questioned more. Many of the townspeople start getting suspicious that they may have something to do with this fever. Five centuries later, we meet Rosella and Emil. Uh, They're teenagers, and they have both learned that in order to fit in in the small town that they live in of Briar Meadows, they they kind of have to do their best to be the same as everyone else around them. While neither of them is able to hide their darker skin, they can disconnect themselves from their culture and their background and their history. So for Rosella, this means dressing and talking like the other girls around her. For Emil, this means hiding his Romani heritage and refusing to learn anything about his family history. The two are sort of brought together and forced to look at their culture and their histories a little bit more during what's called the glimmer. Now the glimmer is a time of magic that comes into the town of Briar Meadows once a year. And this magic brings a wavering light that kind of appears over the reservoir and very, very strange things happen. Um, And these strange things affect everyone and everything in the town. One year, it brought icicles that tasted a little bit like rose candies. 
Uh, another year, the thorns on the trees and the plants grew so fast that you could just sit there and watch them. Um, and all of these things are just very strange things that happen every year in October. The family or the town has just sort of come to expect it. Now, in this town, Rosella's family is known for their beautiful, intricately made shoes, and most specifically, their red shoes. So when the glimmer comes into town this particular year, it causes every pair of Oliva family shoes to come out of closets, specifically the red shoes. So they come out of closets, shoe boxes, basements, and they demand to be worn. Now, Rosella herself does not own a pair of these red shoes, but she has managed to piece together scraps of a pair that her grandparents made years ago. And she's been able to put them together and form her own pair of shoes. But when she puts the shoes on, they start to control her a little bit. And what they start to make her do is dance, frantically dance and not be able to stop. She also finds that she cannot take off the shoes no matter what she tries to do. As the dancing worsens, uh, she is put into more and more dangerous situations. Um, it becomes clear that Emile, who has a background um, of Romani heritage and might know something about the fever that occurred in 1518, uh, it is up to him to figure out what is happening. So he now has to learn more about his family and learn more about his ancestor, Lala, who in Strasbourg in 1518 may have had some connection to this dancing fever. Anna Marie McLemore is a queer non-binary Latinx author, and they often incorporate their own experiences and backgrounds into the stories they write, uh, which is really great. You kind of get that personal, personal take and personal experience on, on these situations and on these um, on these specific people. Their books always feature Latinx and Spanish speaking characters as well as queer characters, which is really wonderful. I found parts of this book kind of difficult to read, um, mainly due to the persecution that is talked about that some of these characters deal with. I, I find it it's similar if I'm reading um, books about the Salem witch trials where I just get so angry and so frustrated with the unfairness and the unjustness of what is happening to these people. Um, but I do think that it is really important stories to tell and the book itself is really beautifully written. Um, and I think that the stories and the themes are are really important and everyone um, should read them. So that is, is my book. That is Dark and Deepest Red by Anna Marie McLemore. Thank you, Sadie. That sounds really good. And and you describe it really well because I was like, that's so complicated. I'm trying to like figure out the mm -hmm. timeline and mm -hmm. all the things that yeah. are happening. That sounds great. Yeah. All right. And Fiona also has, I was trying to read about your book and I'm like, I, I, I'm waiting for you to tell me about it. Yeah, I'm super excited about this one and I really want to do it justice. Um, so I'm going to try to take my time. Um, my book is Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead. If you ask me what my favorite book was or is, I would I would probably say Dracula, and then I would say this book. It is one of those books that just like blew me away at the time and changed my understanding of what a book can be <laughs> uh, because it's just like so unique and honest because I think it really comes from a lot of the, the author's lives, lived experience. So the protagonist in Johnny Appleseed is Johnny. Uh, he is a two-spirit indigiqueer um, Indian glitter princess. So in that instance, uh, he uses N N D N uh, uppercase, um, which is uh, just a common slang, I think, um, used for and pronounced Indian. Uh, yeah, and he considers himself to be a glitter princess. He is currently living off the reserve in the big city, which I, I'm pretty sure is Winnipeg, but I'm not sure they explicitly say that. And he is working uh, as a cyber sex worker and he sort of, he fetishizes his otherness to attract patrons. Johnny is doing this work to make ends meet, but I think uh, he also finds it fulfilling. It allows him to explore and reinvent himself uh, in his identity and sexuality in a really sort of expansive way. However, he also um, finds himself to be disappointed by his, his patrons, especially the white male customers who um, 
sort of limit his identity and disassociate from um, his identity from him as a person and really just sort of sexualize him without seeing him as a, as a person. Johnny is a really unique, but very like real and solid character. Uh, he's scrappy and resilient. Um, and he kind of, he lives this precarious life in poverty, like working, like not even really paycheck to paycheck because it's more like e-transfer to e-transfer, but he's not like down on his luck. He's thriving in some aspects of his life. Um, so in the novel, uh, he is called by his mom who begs him to return home to the res for his stepfather's funeral. So Johnny has seven days to collect bus fare to get back to the reservation. The week that follows is filled with reminiscence and scrambling to get that money. Johnny remembers his stepdad's role in squashing any part of Johnny uh, that was that he saw as not masculine enough. So he sort of has these this really conflicted feeling about um, going home for the funeral of this man who. Uh, you know, has been there throughout his life, but also played a pretty negative role uh, in in how he sees himself. He also remembers uh, his loving relationship with his Kokum and his mother, um, and his first and current love um, that developed with his friend Tias um, while he was on the reservation, uh, and then Tias goes with him to the city. Meanwhile, he is working a lot more and eating a lot less, all to sort of scrounge up this money to get back to the res for this funeral. Um, Johnny's journey is about finding a way to be all of himself, both Indian and queer, and how he seems to always be forced to choose one of those things. And you know, whether it's it's a matter of place where when he's in the city, uh, he can he can totally be a glitter princess, um, but he sort of loses some part of his identity, whereas on the res, uh, he's not allowed to be as queer as he wants to be. So he's sort of trying to find that place where he can really be himself. The book uh, talks a lot about, or it looks at poverty, um, hypermasculinity, colonization of sexual identities, but also has this sort of positive side of of joy and finding joy in unexpected places, more so unexpected, I think, for the reader uh, than Johnny himself. Uh, it's a very sex positive book. Um, it's vivid, triumphant, frank, fierce, um, and unapologetic. Uh, it is very, um, maybe graphic is the word, so I don't think it's for all readers. It's, if you're a little um, shy about reading about sex, like. Definitely don't. It's not for you. Um, but otherwise, I think it's uh, it's something that people should really put on their to read list. Um, it was so just like unique. And when we talk about, you know, diverse reads, I don't think like on one hand, I really felt like it was representative of um, a lot of people who are struggling in the queer community. And have to do jobs uh, like in sex work, which um, you know just don't have don't have the safety around them, um, and and being in this position where you maybe don't have the support um, from family members or community members, um, and and it really I think illustrated that precariousness um, that comes along with some people having uh, and their queer identity um, of having to make choices that can alienate you uh, from those supports. Um, but it was also really resilient. So I f it just, it really represents this, I think, slice, the sliver of um, queer stories that was just so honest and real, but also not something that I've ever experienced um, reading about uh, in, in a way that wasn't, from an outside perspective that was really sort of like um, pitying uh, because Johnny is like so, uh, he's just so triumphant and, um, and fierce, yeah. So definitely read it. Uh, Joshua Whitehead is the author. Uh, he's uh, 
also identifies as two-spirit and indigiqueer, and he's a poet of OG Cree um, from the Pegua First Nation, Canadian. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to reading some of his poetry as well. So check it out. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. I'm glad you're bringing another Indigenous author in, and of course Canadian, because that's what <laughs> that's what Fiona does. Always, just like how we try to fit fantasy thing in and, and Fiona is bringing different things in. So that's great. Thank you. And I think just we were laughing about the whole vampire thing because we just had that conversation that's about true. vampires this morning. Mm-hmm. I think that's why we were all like, <laughs> we're like vampires. Um, but I just remind me of like this one that I think Fiona, since you love Dracula apparently so much, which is something that I did not know and didn't expect either. Mm-hmm. So that was new to me. But there's a new book coming out called Vampires Never Get Old. It's a collection. Mm-hmm. They basically take the, the whole vampire um, kind of thing and, and turn it into more like sort of diverse kind of voices. So it's a collection of, oh, cool. you got like, uh, you got Julie Murphy, you got Rebecca Ronhouse, you got Samira Ahmad, you got a whole bunch of different YA authors in it. So I think nice. that might be something that you might be interested in. Yeah, that sounds yeah. amazing. Apparently it was a bunch of authors that they were like, you know what we miss? vampires and then they so they got together and wrote a, a vampire book so i like the double use there of like vampires never get old of like yeah they don't age but also we never get tired of them it won't happen <laughs> clever so clever mm-hmm. <laughs> i also All love right. that mindset of like you know what we haven't seen for a while you know what we really need some we need vampires, vampires. Let's, let's vampires. bring them back <laughs> different kinds of vampires yeah (laughs) all right Liz do you have something different for us I feel like I I loved all the different kinds of books that we're bringing today so Liz what have you got for us yeah I'd say um the book I've chosen today for this category um is a bit different from the books that have been discussed already um I decided to talk about On a Sunbeam which is by Tilly Walden um, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because um, she also authored and illustrated an acclaimed graphic novel called Spinning. That was a biographical um, look at her own adolescence, in it, um, where she really found who she was as a person, and that included her sexuality. On a Sunbeam, I'd say, um, in my personal opinion, is... Um, equally as good as uh, spinning. Uh, it's received a lot of praise from um, not just others who are interested in graphic novels, but also those who uh, maybe write more traditionally um, in the science fiction sphere. This one does take place um, in a future timeline, uh, partially in space and in different worlds that are sort of um, uh, not exactly defined. So not sure when exactly in the future this takes place, but it is a time um, where they are traveling around in a spaceship um, that kind of looks like a fish for whatever reason. Um, Now, if you are interested in reading on a Sunbeam after we chat about this today, um, you can either place a reserve on the book that we have at the library, or you can also still read it as a web comic. So you can look at the installments um, in the sections that they came out in originally, but it was really great to see this um, compiled and bound together. Uh, Now, there's two storylines that are going on within On a Sunbeam, and they they kind of inform each other. So the primary storyline, or one of the storylines, is that a group of uh, individuals, sort of a ragtag bunch, which uh, is a few adults and also two adolescents, um, they are traveling together on this uh, spaceship, shaped like a fish, um, and they go and do jobs. So they're kind of like a contractor crew. Um, and they travel around to different locations um, in order to do restoration work. Now, the types of locations um, and structures that they are restoring, these are beautiful architectural locations, beautiful buildings um, that that reflect on the sort of beauty of a, a world that once was. So um, they kind of are like, I guess, our heritage homes, um, if we wanted to find an analogy for that today. So they go and then they restore these places to their former glory. Um, So they are working together as a crew, but you can really see in the storyline that they are a family of sorts. Now something interesting to note about this book is that um, there are no male characters within the story. They're all either uh, female or female presenting or non-binary actually. 
But ultimately, it's not really something you think about. Um, when you're reading the story, these are people. These are people with uh, raw emotions uh, and raw feelings. And so they've come together as a ragtag bunch and are protective of each other and work together and are a family and there for each other. Now, um, one of the two adolescents, her name is Mia. And the other timeline within the story uh, takes us back to Mia's life prior to working with this crew. Um, she was admitted to an elite boarding school where, as, as some teens are, feeling kind of awkward and, and wondering, what am I doing here? But she does meet somebody who uh, ultimately grounds her at the school and in a very positive way. And that student is named Grace. And they fall into a romance. They're like the best of friends. And ultimately, that brings Mia out of her shell, and she's enjoying her time at the school and enjoying her time with Grace. Uh, however, a series of events happens where that leads to Mia being removed from the school and ultimately ending up with the crew of the spaceship. Now, it was really interesting to see how the two timelines are interwoven together. Um, it's not only a story about relationships, relationships of all kinds, whether that's romantic or family. It's really a story of self, self-discovery. So no matter the time or place, uh, whether we're in the future, whether we're in the present day, um, it was a really beautiful story to see um, how these very inherently human struggles were illustrated by Tilly Walden. Yeah, she just has a real knack for in, in sort of her sparsity of her illustrations um, and also in her um, dialogue. Um, it's just really amazing to see what she could do with that. So I felt that Honest Unbeam was definitely um, well worth the acclaim. Uh, maybe for some of you who um, are sort of averse to graphic novels, this might be this might be a nice one to to give a try. It's such a this book. <laughs> So this, all right, and um, I will go take another sharp turn into something completely different. I'm excited. Um, I'm excited. So uh, my book. Okay, so every now and then there is going to be a book that is so charming, so adorable, so cute that it could warm even the darkest hearts in the world. So anybody who is more leaning towards the dark side could still enjoy these books. And this, the one that I have for you, I feel like is one of those because it's not usually my type of book, but it is so my type of book in so many ways. Um, this is The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. Like I said, this book, it just I, I love this book. And it was just probably the biggest surprise for me this year so far in terms of my, my books that I read. Um, I didn't expect to like this book this much, but I just love this so much. Um, it is going to make you smile. It's going to make you laugh. It's going to make you cry. It's going to make you get all, all the feelings, all the feelings in this book. Um, so bear with me if you listen to the premise of the book. You're like, that sounds like a fantasy. It is a little bit of a light fantasy. Um, so the story is about Linus Baker who is a caseworker for the department in charge of magical youth. So there are kids out there that has magical powers or they are not quite humans. They're half human, half something else. And they put these kids in, in these homes and, and they call them orphanages. And Linus job as a caseworker is that he goes around to all these different homes to make sure that the kids are safe from the world, that they are safe from each other, and that the kids are really well taken care of. So Linus takes his job pretty seriously. Like he's a serious person. Um, and he really takes pride on his job. He really believes in the welfare of the children. And so to make sure that the kids are safe, he really goes by the rules. Like he has this big rule book called the rules and regulations for the department. And he loves the rules so much that he actually bought himself an own copy so that he can have this book with him all the time. So he can refer back to it whenever he goes around these orphanages to make sure that the kids are well taken care of. And because his reports are so meticulous, they're so detailed, it's so always so objective, the extremely upper management decided to give Linus a level four secret assignment. So they call him up one day and they say, okay, so Linus, tomorrow at six o'clock, I want you to get on the train and you're going to visit this special orphanage. You may not have heard of it, but this is a special orphanage that has many, the kids there are 
quite special. They're not quite what you have met before. And um, I want you to go there and spend about a month there. And every week I want you to send us a report because we really want to know whether the kids are doing okay. And we want to know how the orphanage is going. And especially, we we'll need you to assess the caretaker because we're not quite sure if he is good enough or his fit for this job. So I need you to your honest assessment. So this is really, really important. You can't tell anyone else secret assignment. So offline let's go the next day and for our cat lovers in our um on our group here there is a cat linus doesn't really have like lots of friends that he could you know like have, can cat sit for him so he brought his cat along on the trip six o'clock get on the train and when he got off he was at the last station and there was nobody else left he was the only passenger and he got off and he was on the platform no one is there and then the payphone start ringing and so he's like oh i guess i'll go answer that phone and so he went there pick up the phone and the personal phone was like oh good you're there well i'm supposed to come pick you up but i don't want to like wait for you like in case you don't show up so well now that i know you're there i'll come pick you up now and so linus is like okay and then he has some time so he was like well i was told that you know, when I get off the train, I should read the files because he was told he was not allowed to open up the files that was given to him by extremely upper management about the orphanage just yet until he gets there. So he figured that he can use some time to familiarize himself or sort of the background of the orphanage. So there was a letter on the top, you know, you know, outlining the assignment again, explaining how, you know, secret this is and how important this is. And, and they really need him to, to make a good assessment of that. And then they said, well, you know, we have put these files in the order which we want you to read them in. So he opened the first file, about a six-year-old boy named Lucy. And so he was like, huh, that's weird, a boy named Lucy. And then he looked farther down and he said, Lucy, is short for Lucifer, mother unknown, probably deceased, father, the devil, and species of magical youth, the Antichrist. And he's like, oh, oh dear, oh dear, what is it? What is this? And then he started sweating, you know, his heart started beating really fast and he just flat out fainted right on the platform. And that is just the first child that Linus is going to meet. The premise sounds kind of out there, and it is, um, and that's probably why it attracted me to the book in the first place, because it sounds almost like Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children kind of book. And so I was like, okay, that sounds good. And then, but once I started reading it, I didn't realize, even though it is such a, a, a light fantasy, it is, there's so much heart in this book. It is just such a heart warming read the relationships that linus is going to develop with all the kids with the caretaker author are just amazing they are just so lovely the kids are hilarious i'm not going to tell like i already told you about lucifer that is going to be there but there's other kids who are equally interesting and they're just hilarious linus himself being a such a by the book kind of person he's there the time that he spent there he's slowly discovering sort of maybe other side of him that he doesn't know that he has and watching him with Arthur and the budding romance that goes on there everything is just so sweet so cute but also heart-wrenching at the same time it is such a lovely book again not a book that I I, I think I would like so much but I just love this book it's definitely one of my favorite read um, TJ Klune wanted to make sure that there's this accurate representation of queer people and I think he really did that. He wanted to create a world where different kinds of relationship could exist. And, and he definitely did that in this book. It's just so lovely. Um, everybody, all the personalities, including the cat, even the cat is lovely. Um, so again, this is The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clune. I think it's important that we have on film Virginia saying that the cat, is, the lovely. cat is lovely. I think that that's, yeah, yeah. yeah I think that that's an important thing. That, that they uh, take out of all this is that the cat is lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I did just put my I hold on for that book. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you I just, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't go for cute, but this is just, it's like Liz last week when she talked about the check, please. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of like that. It's just like it's just so sweet and but also very sad. at scene. And I find like I know it's like Pixar movies. I know when I started crying, when nothing is happening, 
Like I'm just anticipating something bad is going to happen and I don't want anything to happen to these people. And mm -hmm. I start crying. That's when I know I'm like fully invested. Mm -hmm. in so I was crying all my way through. Like, but, but it's, it's also very funny. So I don't know. Anyway. All right. Um, so that is our selections and our picks for books by LGBTQ author. Um, there is a great book list on our website. If anybody wants to look for more suggestions, um, there's lots more, lots more out there. Um, and I hope you check those out and hope you love some of the suggestions that we, we suggested and give them a try. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Mm -hmm.